What's going on, guys? Welcome to the VitQ podcast. My name is Johnny D, and we're going to be starting off a brand new series where we're going to be focusing on music professionals and artists from the Vietnamese diaspora community. My guest today is from the agency Off Top Management. They've been established since 2018, representing both athletes and musicians. Very much looking forward to him, um, speaking to him, learning a little bit more about the day in the life of a artist manager. So without further ado, let's welcome Cameron Nguyen to the podcast. All right, Cameron, welcome to the podcast, man. How Good, you doing? man. I appreciate you for having me. Absolutely. So first and foremost, man, I want to go and just kick things off with learning a little bit about yeah. yourself. Uh, why don't you share with me um, basically where you grew up? Yeah, I grew up in the uh, Bay Area, California, the East Bay. Livermore um, is the exact name of the town. Um, after I graduated high school, I uh, went to college in Santa Barbara, then again in Arizona. Um, and I moved to L.A. when I was 20, 20 years old. Okay. Um, so what brought you out here to Los Angeles? I was a sophomore in college at the time. And... Um, just it just wasn't working for me like it was working for everybody else and so i had an opportunity to get involved with a music group um called kaylin and miles they were right on the cusp of signing a major um a major label record deal and um i think in my first or second semester over at arizona um they went ahead and signed that deal and the the budget um allowed for me to to kind of be incorporated in that and uh, i moved out to la maybe a month after the deal got signed. Okay. So basically how, how would you summarize you falling into the music, um, the music industry and where you're at today? And we we'll definitely want to talk a lot about off yeah. top, but how did you fall into the music game? I think um, I always knew I wanted to be doing something on the creative side. Um, I've always loved music, but I was always very aware that I wasn't ever going to be an artist myself for so many reasons, like the, the talent being one of them, um, the, you know, the desire to be out front in front of cameras all the time was another one, but I, I did really have a love for music and a love for kind of putting it together. And so when I first started working in music, I was more so on the creative content side, right? Like I was doing social media stuff and, and photography, video stuff. And it, um, it got to a point where I was working really, really, really hard and working with the top industry leaders, the biggest artists in the world. And I was just tapped out and I, I kind of hit the ceiling and it, it just wasn't high enough for where I wanted to be at. And um, that's when I met my business partner, Neiman, and um, he had been managing Eric Bellinger for a while at this point already. And he just came up to me and said, you know, I want to, I want to sign more artists. I want to, you know, really build this thing up, but I just need some help. I can't do it alone. And I think I was 23 at the time. And um, we started off top together. So let's, let's talk yeah. about off top. So 2018, I believe that's when the, uh, you guys were established. Mm -hmm. So was, you, you mentioned Eric Billinger yeah. earlier, for those who don't know, he's a R and B artist um, that kind of rose to fame, like, um, around what, what year uh, would you say? 2013 ish. Yeah. Okay. 2013. And then, so he was already, um, under management with your business. Yeah, he was under management, right? um, with Neiman and, you know, as management, we, we do everything. We're full 360. Right. And so a lot of managers these days, you know, it, it's such a subjective term. There's some managers that, you know, if your arts assigned to a major label, you don't really have a ton to do, right? Cause you, you get to outsource social media to the digital team and you get to outsource music to the A&R department and they have their own marketing department. Um, all of our artists have always been independent. And so um, when he wanted to get more clients other than Eric, he's like, I can't do it alone. And um, that's where we got together. Um, but yeah, Eric was already under by the time Off Top had started. Okay. Uh, I also saw that you guys not only represent musicians or artists, um, 
actually to clarify is it just artists or do you also represent uh, producers and uh, songwriters we don't well? represent producers and songwriters typically because there's not much as management you can do for producers and songwriters so like i'll have producers reach out and if i like them i'll just say you know you can call me if you need you know if you have questions about things but i don't want to manage a producer for the simple fact of you're going to call me and as if I'm not doing anything for you, you're going to be upset with me as if I'm not out working for you. When the reality is, is like, all I, if you're a producer, I can send your packs out to other artists. I can send loops out to bigger producers, but I can't guarantee you any placements and no manager can really guarantee you any placements. And so um, we don't manage uh, producers or songwriters. I, I want to touch on that because I actually um, know a few, um, a few managers that do represent songwriters yeah. and producers and they, tend to be in the uh, either radio uh in the radio space like they're a uh, they have their own radio show or their own podcast yeah, yeah. or like the same space um, too or they're in the yeah. same space right those are the two common denominators yeah. because and it makes a ton well, yeah, of sense because like at that the, point you can kind of control your own destiny right like if you are in the radio space you kind of have that that stepping stone to like well i can get I can add, put this in rotation or I can, you know, at least introduce this and, and there, they, they do a lot of A&R mm -hmm. actually. It's oh like, yeah. I mean, uh, there, there's a lot. Of, I think that's what like really, really smart radio DJs that have a good name for themselves should start doing more of. I know the leakers do it. Um, I think bootleg Kev might start doing it. I know DJ. That's who I'm referencing actually. So a, um, one of my colleagues, his name is beats by chalk. Um, he is, uh, his manager is is Bule Kev, and Huge. it 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 just makes a lot yeah. of sense because you know through doing the podcast, meeting all these um, all these artists, then he's like, "Yo, uh, let me slide you uh, a pack from from yeah. my producer." Yeah, I mean that that's the way to do it. And I know for radio DJs like the Leakers, like Kev, like it's really easy to to become an artist too because there's not many artists that are going to say no to an LA Leakers record because the LA Leakers are on the radio for 3 hours a day and so those are like the few exceptions where it makes a ton of sense to to get in with songwriters to get in with producers because you have that kind of guarantee thing that most people don't already have but so going back to also other types of um talent mm -hmm. you guys represent you also represent yeah. athletes let's let's talk about that uh, uh or that decision to represent athletes. um it kind of just happened naturally i think neiman had been you know we were introduced to victor oladipo um via music we were in the studio with him and um it got to a point where neiman was managing the music side of it um and when victor needed new management on the other side of it the athletic side that you know kind of overall what we're good at it just made sense. It was like the kind of natural transition. Well, you're already doing the music and you already are kind of on all the phone calls with <clears throat> with these brands and with my agency and stuff like that. So you should probably just do the management too. So Neiman spends a lot more time on um, sports than I do. I'm, I'm mostly music, but um, yeah, Victor, Victor Oladipo is on uh, top line as well. This is a question regarding the, the stage that an artist Usually, the, what what stage does an artist come to to you and your group at Off Top? We'll, is we'll it, get um, them at any stage, really. We've signed people that have never had a single song out. We've signed people that are trying to get out of their major label deals. We find people that have music ready to go but don't understand the next step, whether it's distribution, whether it's financing. Um, and so there there isn't really anybody that there, there isn't really a blueprint like oh we need the artist to be at this stage of their career, but we do have very specific prerequisites that have things to do with who they are as a human being, not really so much where they are in their career yet, though. Okay, what are those prerequisites? And so I think the biggest one is being coachable. I think getting, especially from a new artist, getting somebody that really has their mind set on, this is how I expect it to go. It never goes like that, especially if you're kind of just entering the music industry. It's, I think people see, you know, Ice Spice, for example, right now and say, oh, it happened overnight. And it's like, no, you just saw what had happened overnight. But there was two, three, four, five years prior to all of this that you haven't seen. And I think that people like to forget about what happens before you you blow up, right? Like. Jack Harlow is like another good example. You know, he had that big single a couple years ago. 
people are like, oh, well, what, what, this kid came out of nowhere. It's like, no, he used to tour in front of 10, 15 people at a venue. It, it, you just, you weren't there, so you don't see. And so I think when people have this really, really concrete idea of what artistry looks like, that's really tough for us. I think if you don't know who you are as a human being and if you don't know who you want to be as an artist, I think that's almost immediately somebody that we can't we can't really work together well with just because so much of music these days is based on who you are as a human and the music kind of comes secondary to that. I know a lot of, um, I know other managers actually don't like the startup stages because um, it's, you know, time is money, yeah. right? So there's um, usually when you get involved on a managerial level, they're, uh, they're, Sometimes it could be months to years before there's any kind of revenue um, generated. Yeah. So and when um, we, I think they hear that you guys can jump in. Yeah, early. I mean, it, when we jump in early, there there should already typically be a foundation laid under you, whether it be you know a large social following or maybe you are a songwriter that you know Usher owes you a favor, so you have you know an Usher single kind of just tucked ready to go. Um, but I would never help somebody make music for the very first time that also doesn't have some sort of like appeal to them outside of music already um if you you know if you call me tomorrow and said hey like my little nephew wants to get started making music like we couldn't do that but if you said you know hey i got a friend and you know she's mostly known for her fashion sense and she has a million and a half followers on instagram and um you know she her best friend is Zara Larson, and I think that, you know, Zara Larson will give her a feature, you know, then I can get, you know, we can get to work from an entry level standpoint. But I don't think, you know, I don't think anybody when when you're at this point that you're talking about where it's like just starting to get into music, you don't even need a manager. I don't think you really need a manager until that 20 percent that you're giving up to your manager is going to be worth more because of that manager. So that manager needs to be generating you at least 21 percent more because of him. And there's a lot of people that, that don't need a manager for that reason. I agree. I agree. So one of the things that um, we focus here on VQ a lot uh, is we love to spotlight emerging Vietnamese um, Americans or Vietnamese Canadians yeah. and actually just Vietnamese di uh, diaspora all the way across the board. So um, over the course of three years, we've been able to discover or shine a spotlight on Vietnamese yeah. talent in 18 countries. Oh, wow. And, I didn't um, even know there were Vietnamese in every, in 18 countries. You know, there's, it, it, it continues to shock me sometimes when I get a submission. Yeah. Um, and, and especially it's the European countries that uh, I, I always get, like, I always find very exciting yeah. because being born and raised here in America, um, you know, the probability of, of of finding that finding some 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 gems or yeah. some 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 guys that want to kind of tap into this uh, uh this music industry is going to be higher right. right but uh but to find guys from like you know and, and culturally too to find guys from like Europe it's always special yeah. like the Netherlands Denmark to to Czech Republic and and so forth because you get to see the blend of their multiple their multiple identities yeah. and they converge it sometimes in their native, in that language of that country, oh. as well as sometimes even in well, Vietnam. So I'm right? glad you said that because I was about to say, you know, obviously ethnically I'm half Vietnamese, but um, my parents, my dad came here when he was really, really young. My mom um, is obviously not obviously, but my mom's Caucasian. She was born here. And um, my dad grew up in a town where he was the only, you know, his family was the only family that weren't white and so he grew up around a lot of white people i myself from you know a small suburban town grew up around a lot of white people and so i'm just now like probably in my late 20s starting to um align myself with more things of my culture like i i haven't i didn't have fun till i was like 26 years old it, it was it, right wow. it was like when I, and i and I was dating a Mexican girl at the time, and she was the one that actually was like, no, you should probably try this. And so I'm just now starting to, you know, really um, kind of see what Vietnamese culture is like. And so um, 
Yeah, this is. So you're you're just to clarify. So your father is yeah, Vietnamese, my, yeah, right? my dad is. So and then it, to add to that, he uh, grew up in a he he's in a small town where there's probably no no Vietnamese. No, there's um, nobody. There's no minorities at all. Um, it's a really really small town, um, really low um, low income, a lot of poverty, and uh, yeah, he was only you know he I think he has four siblings. Those and his parents are the only non-white people in the whole city so um, I, so i want to ask you two yeah questions. then i want to ask you two questions um, have you ever gone down to uh little saigon here in orange county and kind of uh immerse yourself in let's say asian garden mall and kind of uh in that kind of environment i haven't but um ken who i think is our mutual friend has been telling me about it and it's definitely something on my to-do list i think um, you know, growing up in a predominantly Caucasian community, you don't really, uh, Vietnamese culture seems so foreign. It just seems so almost polar opposite of everything I know. So admittedly, I wasn't like super enthusiastic about getting to learn a ton about my culture until, until like, yeah, my mid to late twenties. And then, you know, started by eating the food, which tastes amazing. I'm like, oh, this is good. Um, and then. It always starts right, with food, right. Though. It always and starts then with food. um, you know, just me and my my, I got one cousin that's the same age as me. Me and him kind of getting closer, um, and then I think just getting closer with my my extended family, like my my Vietnamese aunties, my Vietnamese uncles, um, who I think probably day to day their lives, um, there's a lot more Vietnamese factors that go into their lives, right? Like the food, obviously. Um, but like the places they socialize, like the first time I met Ken or the second time I met Ken, he took me out to a, um, a stand up comedy show, but it was all Vietnamese people everywhere. And I, I even told him the other day, I'm like, man, that was really, really fun. Like I, I, I've never hung out with Vietnamese people in a social environment until very recently. And it was just really cool to like, I, I don't know how to explain it. Like, like I said, I, I grew up in a, in a white town and I just never really thought about i i, I guess I, I never really like thought about people like looking like me anywhere else it's just like i'm it's not something i know and so um mm -hmm. you know growing up and you know i'm gonna be 30 in december it's been really cool to 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 kind of see to kind of just experience my culture more i um I got something to share with you yeah. on that on that note, but um, just to, I, I I don't want to assume, but have you have you ever had the privilege? I had the honor of going back to Vietnam or vi visiting um, Vietnam. I haven't, and my dad actually hasn't been back since he came when he was three years old either. Um, I, I think that you know, and no, nor has my grandma. I don't think anybody from my dad's family has gone back. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, I, I don't know the entire background, but I believe it has something to do with, you know, what my grandfather's role in the military was at the time. Um, we, we just haven't mm -hmm. even really discussed going back. Yeah, that's usually the yeah. case. It's usually uh, there's some, there's either a very, um, they were very involved in the Southern Vietnamese. Yeah, um, yeah that's uh, how they ended up here. Military. Yeah, that's how they ended up here. They, you know, uh, they got a really quick notice, like, you, you guys got a few hours to get out of here. And they got on a boat, and I think they went to, I don't know where they went to. They went somewhere. Well, that. And then they ended up in that Pendleton. Story in, yeah. And, and that story in itself, I want to actually plug um, a very good, uh, this this podcast called The Vietnamese Boat People. Yeah. They, um, they do amazing work where the premise of it is to tell all these different stories, um, the parents' stories, because look i know it's traumatic yeah. but if we your yourself and even myself yeah. if we don't know these stories how do we um how do we, how do we discover or appreciate let me rephrase that how do we appreciate where um yeah that we are here in america like for example um you you, you just mentioned earlier you didn't really tap into understanding your heritage until a little bit yeah. later in, in your 20s I, I was in Orange County, bro. Right. I was uh, born and raised and I was surrounded by Vietnamese. And guess what I did? I, instead, I tried to assimilate yeah. because assimilation was another big part of um, 
being a Vietnamese American is like, let's not try to stand out. Yeah. Let's try to be American. Yeah. Uh, or yeah. in, in my city was, I was born and raised in Santa Ana, predominantly okay. Mexican, uh, Mexican Americans. So I try to, you know, be, be more with them, yeah. even, even down to, uh, my mannerisms was, yeah. was, was a little bit more on the, um, uh, at the time, the Chicano culture. So I, I didn't, I, I, I embraced the culture at home, yeah. which was the food, of course, and some of the traditions. But other than that, when I'm in school, I would try to assimilate yeah. more. And it wasn't until yeah. my early 20s that um, uh, I started really realize I started realizing that um, there's a lot to being Vietnamese yeah. that uh, I yeah. should start learning more about. Yeah. And uh, one of the first things was definitely the language and the language is something that as you get older in age, it becomes a lot harder yeah. to grasp the language. And um, I'm surrounded by uh, my, my, my nieces and nephews now at their tender age, they're able to pick up the language because right. my, my, my sister-in-law is much more diligent about it. And it's so it it's language is something very, um, I do feel like in the earlier in the yeah. years, earlier in years, you were able to pick that up a lot, um, a lot faster and more, um, uh, yeah, just a lot faster. Yeah, I, you, know, you know, I got three cousins on my dad's side, and none of us were ever even really introduced to the language. And I think that just comes from you know the, the town my dad ended up in. They, they didn't have to speak it. Uh, his parents worked; um, they worked all day, and so they they you know the the five siblings essentially raised themselves. But they all had their own friend group. So they were all individually hanging out with their Caucasian friend groups. And I think just, you know, the natural progression of that is you start to act like them. And so when, when me and my baby sister were getting raised, I don't think there was like any intentional, like, we're going to raise you this, you know, via this culture, via this culture. I think, you know, my parents, my dad just grew up around white culture and, um, you know, naturally, I, I grew up around white culture. And so I don't think it ever happened for me where I was intentionally um, trying to to connect with people of a different um, ethnicity. But I think just naturally by, you know, the town my dad grew up in and then the town I grew up in, it, it just it just happened. It just, you know, I one thing about the town we grew up in is, you know, it is predominantly white, but it's very progressive. And so I didn't actually notice I was around a bunch of white people until I left and until I started like living on my own. And then I was like, oh, I was around white people my whole life until I was 18, 19, 20 years old. And so it's just something that, you know, and that's probably why it took me this long to be like, let me figure out more about this culture. Let me, you know, go hang out with people, you know, that that share the same ethnic background as I do. And yeah, I mean, that story, you know, I, I just learned the intricate details of how my father got here within the last 12 months. I'm 29. I just learned that story. Yes. And so um, it's definitely like new for me, but it's all really, really cool. And it makes you look at your parents differently. It makes you, um, and your grandparents, it makes you just have a ton of respect for, you know, that journey is nuts. And I don't want to like say yeah. it, it exactly because I know I'll mess up a detail or two, but like that, you know, like jumping on a boat with a few hours notice and then, you know, hitting this island and being there for three to six months and then jumped on another boat and ending up in Pendleton. And then, you know, that, that, that's crazy to me. That sounds insane, but, um, you know, it's a, it's a different life and it makes you, you know, really, really respect. It, it made me have a new respect for my grandparents that I don't know if I necessarily had because, um, you know, that generation just does things a little bit different than ours. So I, I, I would, sometimes not feel great about like the language they used or maybe like some like the mm -hmm. physical aggression that I, I don't think I would raise my children with but then you hear those stories and you're like man like they they did a lot to get our family here and you know it's um it changes your perspective especially learning that at 28 29 years old so I mean that's kind of like the primary goal of what why I started VQ Media to begin yeah. with was um kind of, I, number one was to kind of start look, looking for various different um, talent in very uh, in, in all different sectors, whether it was 
I started primarily in the performing arts or the creative arts because um, I'm a musician yeah. myself. I grew up wanting, um, I, if I had, I would say it very confidently. If um, in my high school days, if I had representation of guys that look like yeah. me, that was telling yeah. their stories and, and um, that was doing music, I probably would have went all in yeah. um, during that time frame. But now I'm, I'm but I'm, I'm equally as, as, as proud as uh, right now where the, Gen Zers yeah. um, and millennials are um, growing up in an era where there are representations, and you know they're 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 creating from a really they're they're creating from a very um, good space. Yeah. But what I challenge some of these artists and and also athletes is to deep to dive into a little bit more into dive into their why mm -hmm. and their their learn more about their identity because then from there they're going to be able to. And, and you probably know this more as as also a manager is authenticity, right? And honesty. Yeah, I'm gonna use that word a is lot. What's um, to, during our conversation, it is, yeah. bro, because it's like you know you can. There was the SoundCloud era, mm -hmm. right, where it was like everyone kind of just sounded the yeah. same and, and and follow a certain model. Yeah. Um, but in this age of content creation, um, it, the ones that are going to rise above above and, and, and stand out and connect because it, it's really important for musicians and also athletes to build a community, yeah. right? Oh man, uh, right them, now more than ever. Own brand. More, now more I, than I, ever. I, I, so, I say this all the time. I would rather have an artist that makes bad music, but has the ability to um, garner people's attention and make them feel like a whole community versus the opposite. Mm -hmm. You making good music doesn't excite me anymore because there's a lot of people in the world that make incredible music. But if you make good music and you also have, or even if you, you make you know decent music, but you have the ability to garner people's attention, you have the ability to make people feel like they have representation or like they um, somebody they have a voice that's finally speaking to them, or that they've created a community that you can be a part of, that is more valuable than, you know, the, the raw talent. And I say, you know, I put it in the air quotes because people like to say that, you know, oh, so-and-so is just a TikToker and, you know, they're not an actual artist. They're not talented. They're not even, and it's like, well, what is talent though? Because it's so subjective. To me, having that ability to, get people's attention and hold on to their attention and get them excited about what you're doing and get them to want to support you and buy your merch and come to your shows and join your Instagram lives. That's a talent. That's a talent that I don't think, I think more people have the ability to sing well than have the, than have the ability to, to gain people's unconditional attention. I, I can't agree more. Um, it's, you know, one of the, um, during, I think over the past 12 to 15 years, there was the rise of the singing competition, right? The, the oh voice, man! Um, Don't get me started on this because I so, have I have like the most um, put, like I I have the most convicting argument about this, and I feel like you're about to say it. I want like I, and, and you know what? It, it's like I I'll give you a little bit of context because yeah. I am a trained classical technical singer, so like okay. respect to vocalists, right? I'm gonna call it what it is: vocalists for being dope at that. Right. But when you're in the music business and the music industry, there's there's more color to to than to that instead of just the days of just doing these up uh, like almost acrobatic runs. Yeah. You know, where like showing off. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, people aren't vibing with that anymore. Man, I, like, I say that all the time because I work in the R and B music a lot, and I'm you know I I hate overly vocal produced things because it's intimidating to a listener now. Right. You have you have six stacks of harmonies on a run during in the middle of your verse like nobody's gonna want to sing along to that that's intimidating for the average consumer that's just driving down the car that wants to you know learn the lyrics to this song that they don't want to hear that that's not impressive to anybody one and also they don't even want to hear that it's not easily digestible and the reason i have an issue with the the singing competitions is because you're getting rewarded based on something that's not necessarily going to help you be successful in the music business Right, because if I go on Hollywood Boulevard, there's seven people that have incredible voices, just 
with a with a basket in front of them asking for a dollar. And I, I especially hate the one where you can't see them. You got to turn around. Like you hit the button and then you turn around and it's like, no, seeing them is is 75% of the battle. Like we want you to look like a superstar. Like that's just the truth of the matter. Like it, it's, we want to, we want to see something that feels larger than life to us. And, and just having a good voice isn't going to cut it anymore. No, it, it isn't. And um, that's why there's a lot more skill sets. It is a different time for artists um, to, to really reevaluate that. You still, I will say you still got to have, you still got to have some skills for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Some, yeah. I, I would never there. suggest like, you know, to, to walk into a studio without any idea of like music structure or anything like that. But I think that once you have the, the, the social side down of it, I think the music part is the easier, the easier battle. So what we talked about simulation earlier and um, now I kind of want to talk a little bit about the current, global globalization of music right yeah. and where things are headed this is why i feel as i'm speaking to these young emerging artists that are vietnamese heritage or biracial or whatever learn take a take a step and learn a little bit more about your heritage because yeah. guess what in 2023 we're now seeing um the rise of not just and i'm not talking just about asians but i'm talking yeah. about yeah. a latino community bad bunny's the biggest artist did. in the world right now bad bunny's the biggest a hundred percent. I don't even know what he's it, saying, but I'm gonna go to the show. And 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 you know, for him to accomplish what he's done, and um and and do it in actually multiple different subgenres as well. Mm -hmm. Like he's known for reggaeton, right? But he's 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 kind of moved into all these other genres now. Mm -hmm. I I would argue that most people even say lat Latino music now has yeah. now it's more it's it's pop music. Um, yeah, and um, it is. I mean, you 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 look at. Uh, phenomenal talent here that's she's a mexican american becky g she's yeah. she's jumped over and she's now again reinventing herself she she jumped over to reggaeton when she mm -hmm. got a collab with um, bad bunny which yeah. kind of kind of over her to south america um and then now she's also doing something incredible that's very truly mexican where it's uh she's yeah she tapped in with this um uh um put what's his what's his name it starts with a p um Faso, no, uh, he does regional he does regional on uh, uh narco okay. music but he's one of the biggest mexican artists at the moment yeah. right now too um but kind of going to going back to the now with the artist like artists from korea yeah uh, bts oh, like pink another I mean, like i mean yeah bts is you know again like arguably one of the I mean, definitely the biggest group in the world. Um, arguably, they're, they're, the top they're five. They're probably one of the most profitable, definitely, hands down. Absolutely. They, and where I'm kind of going with all this is that they brought people aren't, you know, they're singing also in Korean, they're singing in English, yeah. but mm -hmm. like people are trying to learn their language and their culture, yeah. and because they they brought so many different new elements to the music game that I think now it's the time for people to be different, right? And to embrace um, being different as well, instead of just assimilating. You know? I think too, um, when it comes to music, there's always gonna be a space for the Kendrick Lamars and you know the, the very introspective artists, right? But I think the average consumer just is, like they wanna feel good. And the thing about, the um, Bad Bunnies and the Becky G's and the BTS's is like, it doesn't really matter what they're saying because it just makes people feel, you know, it makes people feel good and it makes them happy. And, um, you know, I've always, always been somebody that has put more emphasis on melodies before subject matter. Like mm -hmm. a good melody, I'll sing anything if it's in the right melody. And I think that's why I can appreciate like female artists that are maybe talking about something that I necessarily don't connect with, but they say it in a cadence that is catchy. Um, I think the same thing for Bad Bunny. I don't know a single thing he's saying, but that cadence that he likes to sit in, that pocket he likes to fall in, I think is just really, really, really polarizing and it, and it pulls people in. And so I think that, um, you know, international artists are starting to understand that good music is going to travel, right? Like, I remember Becky G, because we used to tour with her. We, you know, we do the radio run. And this is when she was Becky G with the gap, the gap in her tooth. 
mm-hmm. and we'd see her every show and we'd you know we'd catch up with her and you know it, it, it always felt like it always felt like she had um hit this ceiling that she just couldn't break through and then we didn't see her for a couple years and then when we saw her again it just felt so much more authentic and it was you know when she made the transition to um the kind of music that she's doing now and so i think when it comes down to like international artists or you know artists wanting to really dive into their own culture i think that's really one thing to keep in mind is um good music is going to speak for itself right like bad bunny's selling out you know arenas in places where nobody speaks spanish but it just feels good to people and they like how it sounds and like they like how it makes them feel and they want to just have a good time and they they love the the music they love the melodies and so um don't feel like you have to you have to sit in this box to be successful especially these days um and on top of that once you do really embrace your your ethnicity i think those people are going to embrace you back um, 100% i think that's like super super important too um that probably comes with the new social media age but that if you embrace your ethnicity those people are going to welcome you with open arms so um i want to I, I just want to kind of get a a, a a gauge on what uh, i know you didn't grow up so much within the community and also yeah. um, probably don't know much about the the game uh, the music game in in vietnam but when you hear the the genre or you hear vietnamese music what yeah. are the what are some of the word associations or what are some of the <laughs> artists that come to mind or instruments that come to mind there's definitely not a single artist that comes to mind but i think um i think slower tempo i i think that there aren't any and i could be 100 percent wrong about all this but i don't hear a lot of synths or anything that's like computerized I, like i think of um a lot of acoustic instrumentation everything down tempo um you know growing up when i would go out with my vietnamese family they you know big on the karaoke and so I, i'd get like little glimpses but i don't know if that is that music is um a good reflection of what today's vietnamese like pop music sounds like so i, I mean i really don't have any artists in mind but um when i think of vietnamese music that's like the first thing that comes to my head is going out as a younger kid and and hearing the karaoke and thinking like oh that music sounds different than what i know of but um is i mean it, i'll ask you like is there a um like a pop um centralized vietnamese artist yeah i, I definitely could um i can expand on that so first first and foremost uh karaoke that yeah. staple of most asian cultures right yeah. uh, but what makes it very more um important for let's just say southern vietnamese or ones that fled the war uh um and and why the karaoke like for instance maybe your father and hearing those types of karaoke tunes you you're spot on in terms of hearing the slower mid tempo a slower mm-hmm. tempo acoustic stuff because a lot of the music that was um, made popular back in the um, 60s and 70s for the southern vietnamese were were primarily um very sad ballads and uh, yeah. love song um breakup songs and such because i mean there there but there there were there were also influences from America, um, America as well, which is like rock music and yeah. so forth, which we don't, uh, we, we don't hear in karaoke often because yeah. when most of our, um, elders, um, our, uh, our parents would sing karaoke, it's always about nostalgia, right? Yeah. And right. What was the subject? And, and, and me too. Like I'm, when, if you bring me to karaoke now, I'm going to sing the Backstreet Boys, right? Like it's, it's just a nostalgic thing. And for them, so the, what was the subject matter? It was about, I let my, I, I had to say goodbye to my mom. I had yeah. to say goodbye to my, my girl who I, I, you know, we were split because of, of, of just, I had to do what I had to do or, um, you know, and, and it was always about memories of yeah. the, their, their old villages and things like that. So it was sad. Man, that's Most heavy of, stuff. It's heavy, but you know yeah. what? It, it, but at the same time, it was, it was some of the, um, and it was very poetic to be yeah. quite honest. Some of the, some of the big songwriters of that jo- of the, of that generation, they, um, I grew up just so you know, one of the ways that I bonded with my, my family was we sang, um, my father taught me karaoke. Uh, I learned Vietnamese through karaoke. I didn't understand mm. 
a word I was singing oh. because it was because the words were not conversational, right? right. So the word was was poetry. So um, I could never transfer over what I learned how to right. sing. But at the same time, it, I felt I can say for sure I always felt the pain. I always yeah. felt um, the struggles that they they and, and that kind of goes back to like why people love Bad Bunny because we don't know what he's saying, but we can feel like oh he he's he, he's bringing us a party right now. And so I think you know that that's like the beauty of international artists is it's, it's a more of a feeling than it is anything else. And and the reason why I would say our generation, let's say um, why we didn't really see our career paths kind of going into Vietnamese music is because, yeah. yo, this just sound, it, it's like, it, it, this is just sad stuff, right? Like, yeah. what, what about the brighter days? Because the things that would show up in variety programs was those types of songs. Yeah. So um, Vietnamese music to me growing up was, was sad. <laughs> did you, um, did, did your parents ever um, emphasize a, a specific career path for you? Um, not, I actually, they thought they, they, they actually felt that maybe music was going to be my pathway, oh, wow. but, um, but more like classically I, trained stuff, but I was classically trained, yeah. but what I, I remember the, um, the class that changed my trajectory, which was, I took, um, I took jazz for a year and cool. jazz in being classically trained where everything is so technical and on, um, on, you know, to the T what's on that sheet music right. to being jazz where it's about feeling. Right. It was in constant conflict. It was in conflict the entire right. the time. But it, right. but it opened my eyes a whole different uh, um, perspective. And I, I love, to this day, I still love jazz um, because of it. But because I'm so trained in the pocket. Yeah. Right. Would, like everything know, needs to be quantized to pocket, like a hundred. Yeah. It was in the pocket. So yeah. Um, it it, be, it was quite a challenge for me to kind of uh, step outside of that, especially when I did studio sessions. Um, when I I was I did pursue um, a, a career in music, and yeah. my producers were always be like, "You need to step outside of the pocket sometimes. You need to yeah, you need right. to feel you need to feel this 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 line." And I would just boom. It was you know yeah. I mean that's what that's what producers are doing now. They'll dequantize their stuff just to make it feel like a little more human and a little less computerized, and so. It's funny that you're a human that was always right in the pocket versus, you know, now we're trying to, our, we're trying to make our computers not be in the pocket. You were just a human that was like a computer. So kind of going back to there's, so then when I started diving in and try to, I did a deep dive into what is Vietnamese music or yeah. B-pop in particular, um, it, the, the sound of modern day pop music in Vietnam is, um there i can i can describe it as there's certain there there's probably like a good dozen or so artists that um will bring certain cultural um uh, elements to it whether it's instrumentation mm -hmm. um whether it's uh, a certain chant like a style yeah. of okay they, so if it's a vocalist they'll bring some of these really cool or and 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 or subject matters right yeah. Um, to the table, but um, but it's it's more with a, a modern uh, and uh, elevated uh, elevated sound. What uh, so, what what are the drums like? Is it like poppy? Like, man, I think to get into the specifics of that, it's 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 quite interesting. It, it it it's whatever you I I I can't put it to words. To be I asked honest. because I had this conversation the other day, like whatever the top line stuff is in this beat, you can make it whatever genre you want, right? If you want to, if you want to put some reggaeton drums under it, it's going to be a reggaeton beat. Now, if you want to just make some very like traditional pop drums under it, it's going to be a pop song. Like the, and so I'll, I was curious to know, like, d does that snare kind of lean more towards like an Afro beats um, or I, a reggaeton? I would, I would say Afro beats is probably going to be the next um, influence uh, yeah. from, this younger, this young generation. So it's like uh, hundreds tempo, like like mid tempo, up tempo stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's nice stuff. Yeah, I need to check some of it out. Yeah, but so but you know what I'd love to have to do with you is actually a full kind of a a whole session where you listen. I'm giving you kind of a a quick recap on how where all the sounds are coming from. Yeah, and the artist that kind of transcended, um, uh, like you know, in, in, transcended the 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 sound and defining what yeah. v pop v pop is but um 
what the more the journey of why I study so much on VPOP recently is because as a American born Vietnamese, um, I identify with the artists from over on this side of the pond, right? right. Where we, you know, they, they're incorporating um, the English language, they're writing, which is um, in their, in, that's our native language, right. you and I. Um, they're influenced by Western um, uh, or American artists and, and, and kind of coming to that. But like, if you were to say that to our parents and say, is that Vietnamese music? Right. They will say, 100% that is not Vietnamese music. So I argued that for, 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 for many years of like, why is that not Vietnamese music? Mm -hmm. What is, then I started asking, you know, how Kenneth like to ask, what does Vietnamese mean to you? I yeah. started asking, what does Viet, what is Vietnamese music? So what, what are the answers you're getting? Is it subject matter for the most part? It's, um, so, it, so it's, so it's to, to whomever you ask it. So mainly to the older generation, yeah. I would say it's like, it's, a certain um, generation um, is what they would consider uh, mm. Vietnamese music. For example, uh, a Southern Vietnamese immigrant, Vietnamese music to them is music from the, the from the South, not necessarily the Northern, which they felt is propaganda music. Okay. Um, so to them, Vietnamese music was, uh, and it's just another fact that um, I found that was crazy was it, after the war um, was over, the um, the government decided to destroy all music from the south, uh, like because it was it was all done in vinyls and 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 and, and so right. forth. When you when you, when you could destroy all the music and like legitimately never have it a trace of it ever again, and they did that because yeah. like they're trying to usher in some new you know their own influence, right? But right. Um, the most notable brand uh, that is known even in Vietnam, um, the Paris by Night brand. Um, they in the early '80s created a, you know that that CEO the the, the founder, um, he wanted to uh, bring to get bring back a uh, all those all those songs he grew up on yeah and give, give that as a gift back to his people. Mm. So he created a reality program. I mean, I'm sorry, a variety show, um, and that went on to be in history a very significant um gift that he provided to yeah. the, the, the all the vietnamese diaspora uh, around the world what was this this was in the early um i would say early to mid um, 80s okay um that he did this program and it still runs to this day but it lost a lot of its um esteem because they didn't really focus on evolving and bringing on yeah. generation all right so think of think of like uh, WandaVision where everything's kind of stuck in a specific era mm -hmm. or like yeah. to be more actually another good example would be like Motown where yeah, Motown okay. didn't, didn't really evolve it kind of stayed um, right. within that but um, so yeah so like if you're asking them they wouldn't consider someone like I, I shared with you an artist named Keshi a Vietnamese yeah. American um, 27 year old dude who's just killing it in the game they're like he, he's not a Vietnamese artist in my opinion and so but, I, but um, why is that because he's too big no, no, no. It's not. It's or, not about. Or... It's really about like that. So, what my mission right now is to go on this. Like, what are the primary criteria that you would define a Vietnamese artist? As right. With because do you, do you feel, think you can get a concrete answer though? Because I don't think I can get a concrete answer. To be it, quite it's honest, it's so nuanced, right? Like, you go, you're if you're in LA, Florida, Georgia line is country music, but if you go to you know, like a Tim McGraw concert, Florida Georgia Line is pop music. Like it's it's so uh, relative and subjective to so many people. And I think, I, I guess that's like, you know, the cool part about music, but it's also funny to hear, you know, what people consider authentic, what people consider not authentic um, when yeah. it comes down to stuff like that. I mean, I think my ultimate goal, I don't think I'll get a, um, a agreed upon uh, right. answer, but I, I want to at least find three characteristics that people will um, can at least agree agree on, right? So my my mission with AQ is essentially that. So what I've done at least now is I've separated this and created subgenres. The, okay. The genres where I call B pop is music that um, originates from the um, from Vietnam, and it's in uh, primarily most of the words are are I mean most of the lyrics are in Vietnamese, mm -hmm. and it's um. It's, it, it, it has popularity in the country of Vietnam, right? So yeah. I define that as V-pop. 
I define the music from the um, 1975, the music from um, the, uh, the, the the music that was supposed to be wiped out by the government. Yeah. I call that, uh, in, in Vietnamese, it's called Viet Hanh music, which oversees Vietnamese music. And um, because that's that was adopted by other historians and kind of how to reference that. Okay. And then I, I, I now have this new emerging genre, which I call VQ music, which is um, a Vietnamese born outside of Vietnam mm -hmm. doing popular music. So yeah. I call, I, I put that in a bucket because it, it makes it easier. And, and for the, um, the, the Vietnamese community in Vietnam, they've actually embraced that, that, that the way that I coined it because they're like, um, VQ is these guys that are, you know, these guys are out, they're, they're not, they're not from our country anymore, but they're still Vietnamese. You right. know what I'm saying? So, and they do popular music. So Keshi to them is VQ. Yeah. Twi to them is VQ. Is, is Twi Vietnamese? She's Vietnamese American. Oh, yes. cool. Man, she's crushing it right now. She, she's crushing it. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. So, like, you know, as I'm going through this journey, I've also, you know, my, my mission is to, because I have a large audience um, of, of, of artists that follows me, I want to yeah. be able to uh, connect with music professionals like yourself who are, um, you know, in, in the business side of things and to be able to pick your brain yeah. and, um, and, and share just th these different perspectives, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So with that being said, kind of going back to um, the music side now, like as a, an emerging artist, yeah. what are, for, for yourself, what are some tips that you can provide some of these emerging artists to, to get your, to get your attention? I think if you're a, like emerging artists, like just now starting to make music, the biggest things for you to do are be self-sufficient. That's really, really big. Like you don't being self-sufficient, try to make sure that there's nobody stopping you from releasing music, right? Like you don't want to be one of those artists that can't get in the studio unless your engineer is available, or I'm waiting for the graphic designer to send me the artwork back, or I'm waiting for the engineer to send me the mix and master back, or I'm, you know, waiting for the producer to send, like, try to learn how to do as much of that as you can. And there's ways to do it without having to like sit down and learn everything, right? Like if you learn how to cut yourself, like learn how to track vocals yourself, it doesn't matter what it sounds like in the session balance, like send it to the engineer. You don't have to wait for a tracking engineer. Just put, put something down to send over or find ways to do your artwork through like websites like art grab, or, you know, there's all sorts of AI shit going on now. So I think self-sufficiency is a big one. Cause the last thing you want to do is, is slow momentum down because you're waiting on something. I think the other thing too, is like consistency. You're not going to be big after your first song, your second th song, your third song, your fourth, you got to keep going. And so don't get discouraged when your 20th song only has a thousand streams. That's most people and don't slow down either because I think the scariest thing is when you see a gap in an emerging artist timeline from 2019 to 2021, they didn't put out any music. I think you lost whatever little, you know, community you had already. And so consistency and self-sufficiency, I think are two really, really big things. If, if you're an artist you, that, yeah, go ahead. I got a question for you, man. Yeah. What, what do you think about an artist who, stacked all their records but they're like i'm waiting for a label to um to submit all this or to to help me with marketing it just depends it, it depends i i'm such an advocate for independence but i'm also very aware that there's huge benefits to being in the major label system i'm not one of those guys that's like fuck the majors like stay independent mm -hmm. like i truly truly believe that some artists are meant for major labels and some artists a major label will kill your career and so as far as stacking records i don't I think that's a bad idea just because whatever you thought they were going to do for you, you can do on your own, right? Like there's not really much a, la a major label can do for you these days that you can't do on your own. Um, and so if you have the hit record, why would you give that away? Why would you sell that copyright to them? If you truly believe in this music, why would you not put it out and grind it out and own that master? Like, own that in perpetuity. And this is coming from somebody who like, I spend a lot of my time these days um, helping artists sell off their catalog, right? 
And that is the product of you owning your masters and choosing what to do with them. And if you would have given your biggest song away to the major label, you wouldn't have anything to show for it. Now, granted, on the flip side of it, their marketing department might have crushed it for you and you're doing so well because of them that you're touring the world and it doesn't matter that you own your masters or you don't own your masters. But if you're going to go in the major, if you don't wait for a major label is what I would say. If you're sitting on records that you believe are hits, put them out and a major label will come to you and either offer you a brand new deal or offer you a deal, including the back catalog. And so there's no benefit to sitting on records waiting for a label to come to you. I'm a big component of also, um, as you get you get into the music game, education is key in terms of um, learning about the music industry. Um, is there any, um, any, any areas you can maybe point to or different websites or different um, influencers on, on YouTube that you can maybe point to yeah. that uh, some of these artists could, um, sh should be checking out. I love everything that Russ says and the reason I like it, well, one, it's true because it, on my TikTok uh, for you page, there's a lot of people that claim to know what they're talking about that are just straight up not telling the truth. Like you guys have a whole podcast with a mic in front of you to not know what you're talking about. That like kills me. Everything Russ says is true. And I appreciate it even more because he lives it. He's still independent without like a real hit. He's not, I don't think he's gone top 40 yet, but he can go sell out Staples Center with no openers. I think everything Russ says, I like a lot. Um, I man, agree. I, I, I think he, no. Yeah, and, and this is something that, like, I'm not even the biggest fan of his music, but I just know every time he says something, I, like, sit there confidently and be like, okay, if there's a kid out there listening to this, this is honest advice. But there's a few podcasts out there that I'm like, like, that is just a bold-faced lie. Like, that's not even how publishing works. And that kills me. So, Russ, I'll listen to. And then, I think understanding how royalties work. Like, it's... it's oh, that's so important. It's a lot more simple than you think, but there's so few people that actually get it. And think about that when you're creating your music. Think about your music like a traditional company selling something tangible. Like, when you're paying for the beat, when you're paying for studio time, when you're thinking about a music video budget, look at it as any other expense, right? Like look at it as your cost of goods. That music video is a cost of good. And how, like if the budget for the music video is $2,000, you got to get half a million views just to break even on that. Is that worth it? Or why don't, you know, you and your buddy have an iPhone, uh, you know, are, are you going to get 500,000 more views just because you spent $2,000 on the video versus spending a hundred dollars on the video? And, you know, getting maybe 20% less views, I, you know, I, that's how we look at music. And that comes from being independent and getting a royalty statement every month and then getting that royalty hit our bank account the day after. And it makes you really start to be like, okay, I know that this is DJ Mustard, but $50,000 is a lot for a beat. This has to be a fucking smash just for us to break even before we even net a profit. And that's how we look at music. And that's how I would encourage aspiring emerging artists to look at their music too, because it's fucking expensive to make music. And that's, you know, another thing about going back to being self-sufficient. Like that's a great way to cut your cost is learning how to track your own vocals, learning how to design your own cover art, learning how to do those little tedious things that are maybe easier to to give somebody $250 for, but if you're going to make this, you know, your primary source of income, you need to be netting something. And, you know, that, that's the way we look at music is how much money is this going to make us? I, you know, if we get 2 million streams, we can spend this much money on the song. Or if we only expect to get half a million streams on the song, we can only spend this amount of money on the song. So I think understanding how your royalty works, I think is big. That's super, super huge, man. Yeah. So, um, what would it mean to you to, uh, if you were, you had the chance to represent a Vietnamese American artist or a Vietnamese artist? Man, I think it would be cool. I think they would be teaching me just as much as I would be teaching them. Um, and I, 
you know, I, I, I love relationships like that um, because I'm a narcissist and I think I know everything, but I'm not so much of a narcissist to where like, I know that there's things I don't know. And I think that when you can enter a world where it's like uncharted waters for you, I think that's when, you know, you get into music because you fall in love with music and then you take a peek behind the curtain and it makes you like, oh, I don't know if I love this as much as I thought I did when I was a little kid. And that's kind of why I enjoy country music as a consumer so much because I'm not in that world at all. So to me, it's all still authentic. And I think that would be very similar, you know, with the Vietnamese artists. It would, it would like feel authentic to me again. And it would, you know, there aren't any of these magic tricks that I know like, oh, this person just did this and that's why the song is doing that. Or this label paid this person and that's why how they did this. I think um, it would just be one of those kind of scenarios where it's purely pure and authentic versus, you know, a lot of the bullshit I'm in right now is, you know, having to play the game. Um, so I think, yeah, I think representing somebody that shares the same background as me, that that's kind of what I would get out of it is like the feeling of like authenticity again, which is something I haven't had in a really long time in music. I think you have so much more ahead of you right now in your career, man. So first off, congratulations to everything you've accomplished uh, Thank you. with our top um, management. Uh, very rarely do I meet um, uh, a young uh, uh, talent manager like yourself, as well as just being 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 Vietnamese. I think that's yeah. super cool. There's another one. It. There's a couple other Vietnamese uh, artist managers from here in the state side. Yeah, there's a ton over there, obviously. The, the artist management game is actually starting to get more. Um, uh, it's more. It's get. It's getting more collect. Um, the the collection of artist managers in Vietnam is definitely yeah. starting to grow because the the artists that they are in, responsible for and the careers yeah. they're responsible for, it it's it's emerge. It's growing. It, Let it's me so ask you a question: Is uh, the typical Vietnamese artist that that's currently stationed in Vietnam that that's their mm -hmm. primary residence? Is that are they typically distributing independently or are there um, big Vietnamese majors over there or like bigger I'm labels? I'm happy to answer that. I'm happy yeah. to answer that. So, um, music is global now. So all yeah. the, um, all the major labels have, uh, almost a footprint in what yeah. I call the, uh, the APEC region. So APEC yeah. stands for Asia Pacific. So, um, Universal, Warner, Sony, uh, they're all based in Singapore. And yeah. as of 2020, most of them now have a footprint in Vietnam. Oh, wow. Uh, so what, what, what's, however, it doesn't mean that the majors were successful going into the market. Um, yeah. it, the music distributors, however, were more successful in capturing the market. Let me, let me expand on that. Um, there's a, there's there's two major distributors from um, uh, that dominate most of the, the Vietnamese market. One is Believe. Believe is a UK okay. based distributor. Um, okay. They entered the market bringing on very sim like the similar American model where um, artists owns the um, the masters and they they really just empower and bring uh, the digitization of music to the table. Okay. Um, but another group by the name of Ying Yang Media they follow more suit with the Chinese media, um, the, the Chinese music industry, which is acquisition of catalogs. Right. Mm, so, okay. Well, so what Ying Yang media did, which is their parent company is 10 cent, um, entertainment, 10 cent being TikTok. Um, yeah. they went into the market, knew that it's going to be transitioned from analog to digital mm. acquired. Literally they, they did advances and acquired the rights to, I would say 59% of the market. And wow. um, a lot of these songwriters and artists were like paycheck, 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 paycheck. Very similar to what the music game was um, here in America, right? Yeah, it yeah. Was like, you yeah, know, you that, see, I was gonna say, like, it sounds like it might be better to be a songwriter over there right now. You, you, you know, everyone was just getting their back. You know, what yeah, I mean? yeah. Um, so when the major labels got there, they're trying to they they realized that they were a little bit later. In, they were they were a bit late to the game. So um, they. They, they ended up having to um, compete against some of these, uh, those distributors, but also groups were forming what um, collect collectives. Okay. Groups were um, uh, forming collectives because just like 
I see that even here in America, there's a lot of the collectives that kind of come to be. You jump on, you you get a bunch of singers, you get a bunch of rappers, you you, know, you jump on each other's records, you guys blow up together, mm -hmm. and then um, so a lot of the 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 major labels were supporting collectives. Um, yeah, Warner supported a collective called Space Speakers. Space Speakers is probably the biggest urban focused uh, collective in the region. Um, the one of their top selling artists generated 100 million views and streams on one of his records. Oh, wow. He's actually a Vietnamese American himself. He did, he did the record and uh, it was a bilingual record, English okay. and Vietnamese. And it, it, that formula of kind of getting, instead of just getting one artist and helping develop them, yeah, started to, they, they started just investing primarily into collectives. Now, Warner does, Warner specifically does have artists that are from the ground up. There's yeah. a few artists that are just tr traditional art, you know, um, artist development and so forth. And right. they, they, they have kind of grown in the region, but they're so over in that market. Yes. The majors are, um, they play a little bit differently than, um, but it's not like they, they play, um, more artists under more artist friendly terms. Yeah, and, and, and I would say also another thing that majors, they, they tend to be a ally for, okay, they're more of an A&R and promotional partner to the global market. So yeah, one, one right. I'll give you an example. Uh, Dua Lipa um, is an example of an international artist that jumped, um, her music got popularized in English speaking um, countries like the mm -hmm. Philippines. So Dua Lipa, before she debuted in America, yeah. she... Um, she entered into the Filipino market and mm. um, marketing wise was able to really uh, uh, get more bang up, bang for your buck yeah. in, that, in that particular market. So what they're starting to do, like um, they're doing right now for Ed Sheeran is they would promote an in-language campaign for him. Like Ed Sheeran would say something in Vietnamese, like Sin Chao, Vietnam, I appreciate you, blah, blah, blah. And then yeah. they will also A&R maybe a record where it's like they replace the female feature with um, a local feature mm. so that they can push the song. Um, so, so that's kind of more of the strategy of what the bigger labels are doing. Yeah. I also work with Def Jam um, uh, out there and Def Jam is their whole focus for Def Jam Vietnam is to develop five artists for the region. Is it, is it, it urban or is it? What, what is it? Oh, urban. wow. Sick. And Def Jam Vietnam primary role is, to get these five artists to where they dominate Vietnam so that they can yeah. add to the, the primary regional collective, which is Def Jam Southeast Asia. And mm -hmm. they, they grow within um, that market. So Def Jam is not interested, Def Jam Vietnam is not interested in the American market. They're right. primarily focused on growing and, 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 and developing um, for the specific intended market and then um, growing it to, for the regional so that um, they stay within their own ecosystem. Yeah, no, that sounds incredible. There's, there's a lot of, so it, it just all in all, um, there's a lot of exciting things happening, but yeah. it's, it, the, the ingredients is authenticity. It's local regional growth. It's building, um, uh, building all your, your fan bases. Um, and, and in that, in, in that market, being a, being a celebrity or being a social celebrity is, is, is even more important than, um, than ever. I was so, going to say, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But they're, what, what they're accepting of now, and I see this trend happening in the next three to five years, is th th how they find their edge is they start connecting with um, their American counterparts, like American yeah. Vietnamese counterparts, and be like, hey, jump on a record with me. I'll right. help expand you. I'll expand you to Vietnam. And then for them, they're like, you help us expand into your your market. So yeah. what one, th one of the things I do at BQ is I, I kind of, facilitate an A and R those particular relationships so that um, everyone will will win on on a kind of a global level. No, it makes a ton of sense. Yeah, so I mean that's that's the journey I'm on. That's um what my my intention for kind of spot shining a spotlight on you is there's not um in America there's not a ton of Vietnamese American um, talent managers. Yeah. So you know specifically focusing on music and and, and athletes. So. I wanted to take this time to really get to know you and um, yeah. And, and no, just I appreciate it, man. And uh, after we get off, send me some links. I want to hear some music. Oh, I got, I, so uh, my, my primary thing is my playlist, which yeah. is uh, a lot of the folks over there are 
are, are, are familiar with, with the okay. podcast. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, uh, what, what can people, um, how can people find you, man? Is it uh, through the website? Is it through Instagram? Yeah, through the website. I'm not super big on socials, um, but through the website, it's our easiest, the easiest way to, you know, kind of get in touch and, um, you know, always looking for packs, always looking for songwriters, you know, always open to signing new acts if, you know, it, everything aligns. Um, but yeah, man, thank you for having me.